Hello, everybody. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, salamat malam. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, uh, in the uh, in the early hours of the morning here. And this is a place, uh, as the world's attention was focused on Glasgow, uh, British Columbia is a place in the world that has experienced everything that climate change has to offer in the last six months alone, unprecedented uh, heat wave in the northern summer here, uh, followed by wildfires and now unprecedented uh, floods. So this is an issue that is reaching into every household around the world and uh, the world's eyes were focused this week on Glasgow and the COP meetings and we are so fortunate to have with us uh, uh, a guest uh, speaker and three panelists uh, who have all uh, been uh, players uh, in COP and they're here to provide their perspectives on the meetings on uh, where we go from here, and we're looking forward to a robust discussion. And to kick us off, I would uh, like to introduce uh, our, our guest speaker to get the session going. Uh, Mr. Choi Shing Kwok is the director and CEO of ICS Yosef Ishak Institute, uh, and is a former permanent secretary in the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources of Singapore. And he is joining us this morning from Singapore, uh, Mr. Choi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Good evening from Singapore. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to give some opening remarks for this session. Climate change is really the critical issue of our time. Although what is at stake for the world is massive and I think Jeff has intimated uh, the sort of things that could be at stake. And also the evidence for acting is very clear. We are still not fully on the path that is needed, despite some considerable progress in COP26. What more then is really needed? To characterize the problem in a way that is easy for everyone to understand, I would like to speak of the solution to climate change as four C's and three T's. Two of the C's are cooperation and competence, which I believe are in good shape. Cooperation is there because many leaders, whether they be politicians, activists, or industrialists, have a genuine desire to work together to solve the climate change problem. There's also no lack of competence, which can be found in the scientific, academic, and industrial communities of many countries. What is deficient is in the other two C's, and these are confidence and continuity. Confidence is lacking between countries, within countries, and across generations. Continuity is essential, but not yet assured, because climate change is a multi-decade problem that will outlast the tenure of any administration, corporate executive, or research director. How then can we increase confidence and continuity? And this is where the three T's come in. The three T's are talk, transitions, and transactions. Each of these elements are necessary, but not sufficient. However, if all three progress in tandem, we have a chance to solve the problem. So the first T is talk. Some believe that talk is just blah, 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 but some talking is indispensable as we cannot build cooperation and generate confidence without it. So what part of the talk in COP26 represented progress? For me, three points stand out. Firstly, the net zero pledges made by more than 140 countries were really important. Even though only a handful have policies and plans in place to deliver them, this is understandable in my view. And what is needed is just for them to follow through. The US-China Joint Declaration to Cooperate on Climate Change in this decade is another important piece. Not only are they the top two polluters, they are also influential on everyone else. Thirdly, the push to have another round of reductions in COP27 in Egypt, and perhaps annually thereafter, is really helpful because more opportunities are needed for some countries to enhance their commitments, and in particular, I'm thinking of India, Brazil, and Russia. 
The second T is transitions. If the world is ever to reach net zero, several difficult transitions in energy, methane, and forest management must be made. On energy, coal and fossil fuels were mentioned in the COP26 outcome document for the first time in the history of the COP. This is good, but it is only a start because in the end, phasing out and not phasing down of, not more, uh, of more than coal is eventually needed. The energy transition will not be easy or cheap and continuity will not be assured because backtracking is always possible. But this is something we cannot duck. On methane, the pledge to cut 30% by 2030 was good, but unfortunately, the greatest emitters of methane are not yet on board, and they need to be. On deforestation, I think the commitments signed by 140 countries are somewhat waffly, but it is a good base on which, from which to ratchet up. The third and final T is transactions. To build confidence across constituencies, certain transactions must be made as part of the bargain between different stakeholders. Finance is the most important such transaction. Unfortunately, the 100 billion US dollars of assistance for these developed countries is still not met. Finance ties the North and the South together, so continued failure to deliver is untenable. The settlement of international carbon market rules at COP26 is a good outcome that will open up another transaction pathway with the powerful incentives that are embedded in the trading of carbon credits. Uh, this is promising for the future and it can even help to settle the finance issue. Finally, I think huge investments are still needed in research and development to bring promising sustainable technologies to market. For these investments to make sense, there must be confidence of a reasonable return this means that consumers must be willing to pay for them. Without that, the investments will not be made and the net zero world will not be attainable. So as you can see, I think there are a lot of tough issues for our panel to discuss about tonight. And I look forward to hearing from them on the best way forward on these and also any other issues. Thank you and back to you, Jack. Jeff, I think you're muted. Classic. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Choi, for uh, for uh, providing uh, such a good opening for us with uh, four C's and three T's, and we'll see what else we can collect along the way. And uh, we are so privileged, uh, uh, friends, to have with us uh, three panelists who have uh, participated in the COP meetings. And um, uh, you have their, their uh, bios are, are available on the, the Global Town Hall site. Uh, so I won't go into great detail, but um, I'm going to ask a, a general question and, uh, and we will hear from, from each of the, of the three of them. Uh, the, the first question will be uh, to each of, of you, uh, what in your view is the greatest outcome of COP26 and what issues did it fail to resolve and what steps are needed next to fill the gaps? And uh, we're going to start this round of the discussion um, with a, 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 in a panel of very distinguished guests. We have a especially distinguished uh, Hiro Mizuno, who is the special envoy of the UN Secretary General on Innovative Finance and Sustainable Investments. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Mizuno, uh, what's your perspective on this? And and you are on mute. I just followed your, <laughs> your, your path. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Jeff. And, uh, you know, it's my honor to join this, uh, you know, town hall discussion. I just uh, came back from uh, from COP and I just visited show uh, briefly in Singapore. So uh, I have continuously discussing uh, and uh, trying to digest what we have achieved and what we failed to achieve at COP26. So first of all, you know that we saw uh, many, you know, the uh, the uh, leaders, uh, national leaders, came to the uh, the Glasgow with the new commitments. And uh, at least like a G7 and mostly most of the other G20 uh, nations, they committed net zero of some sort. So uh, 
on one hand, it was a real achievement. We saw that the, uh, in terms of political ambition, trying to just uh, you know, the achieve net zero by 2050, is compared to the what exactly agreed in the Paris Agreement, that is definitely the uh, you know the uh, audacious step taken uh, by the uh, group of the leaders. And the second, the uh, the positive, what I call success, is there are so many private sector initiatives launched uh, during the COP26, uh, including the you know the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which I'm going to talk later a bit more in detail. But all you know not only from the financial sectors, but many of the private sector initiatives has been launched and which gave us additional hope that the, you know, now the private sector feels that the climate change is really core of their business strategy or business risk management. So uh, we saw like, you know, the private sector actually pushing, uh, you know, police, police, policy makers uh, to, to be more ambitious. So uh, that's the uh, another thing, the uh, sort of a, like a blight, uh, you know, the uh, blight aspect and the success of the uh, the COP26, and then the uh, the one thing I have been pushing for the last, last you know five six years is we just need to have a measurement of the uh, the climate risk and uh, you know the risk and return and also the all the ESG matters and so the launch of the uh, the ISSG Internal Sustainability Standard Board by IFRS trying to set the uh, the global uh, financial disclosure uh, matrix for the uh, ESG, uh, you know, the factors include, including climate was a, was a, you know, the a big uh, announcement. And I see the big, I really have a big expectation out of that, the standard setting board to really change the other uh, financial market behavior uh, against the other uh, climate change. Thanks. That's. I think we have uh, we have experts in in these areas who are going to who are going to jump into the discussion very soon. So uh, the next Thanks. panelist we'll we'll hear from on the same question uh, is Ambassador Jenny Kim. Uh, Jenny is Ambassador and Deputy Minister for Climate Change in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea, and is speaking to us today from Seoul. Thank you very much. I'm also very pleased to join this uh, town hall meeting. Uh, just like previous speaker, I'm just back. Uh, yes, I, 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 I returned uh, from Glasgow just a few days ago. Um, there is a mixed view regarding the outcome of Glasgow conference. Some people say it's, uh, it's more than expected. Some people say it's under, uh, it's, it doesn't meet their expectation. However, um, I would like to focus on, uh, I would like to focus on the, on the change COP26 brought about in the preparatory process for almost two, two years. So COP26, it's just two weeks event. However, in the process of almost two years of preparation, actually COP26 brought about huge shifts in national governments, in private sector, in civil society, and general public. So, during the during the process, actually, COP twenty six really strongly contributed to put the climate change agenda at the top of nation, national agenda in business strategy and uh, the in, in, in general public's attention and also civil society's role. And therefore, regardless of the document COP26 actually produced, I would like to say that COP26 was successful because it strongly contributed to bring about a huge shift in governmental policies, business strategies, and general public's uh, the perception and attitude. I mean, 120 leaders gathered in Glasgow, it means climate change became a top agenda and became an, uh, uh, an agenda of the top leaders' attention. And 90% uh, of global emission and 90% of global GDP are now covered by so-called net zero commitment. So 
it gives huge impact not only to the government, but also to the private sector. Uh, and uh, we all know that uh, the civil society's role and particularly the role of young people, they, uh, they become very, very strong, uh, strong power. Um, mm. Of course, uh, if I just touch, if I just pick up one thing, we feel sorry is even though in spite of this huge shift, still we are far from 1.5 degree ambition. Yeah. So yeah. we have to narrow the gap. That's the work, that's the homework, and that's the work we have to strengthen from next year. Um, maybe I, I, I have to stop here. I think yeah. I spent two, two minutes. <laughs> no, no, well, I think we have, we have some issues uh, that you've put out there that we will come back to in, yeah. in the discussion. And so um, for another perspective, this is truly a global town hall and uh, we turn to Washington uh, and to Helen Mountford, who is the Vice President for Climate and Economics at the World Resources Institute. So uh, Helen, what's, what's your perspective on, uh, on what's come out of COP a week later? Thanks very much, Jeff, and to FPCI for inviting me to join this Global Town Hall. It's wonderful to be with you here um, uh, at this moment as, as we sort of digest still what came out at COP26. And I'd love to build on where Jenny was just finishing in terms of um, in terms of what for me was probably the biggest outcome there was a clear recognition by co countries that we are far off track where we need to be, both in terms of closing the gap to keep uh, keep global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius, but also in terms of financing and support for, for developing countries. And I think um, what was particularly important was that they agreed to come back extraordinarily, to come back next year already with strengthened 2030 national targets, as Mr. Choi uh, mentioned. Now in the Paris Agreement, uh, they had agreed to come back every five years, but because of the urgency and because of how far off track we are, um, for me, a big outcome was that they said, no, we cannot wait another five years. We must come back next year already with strength in 2030 targets. Um, and you know this is important. Uh, coming out of Glasgow, we see according to the best estimates that we're probably on track for a global warming of between 1.9 and 2.5 degrees Celsius, depending on whether you include the net zero targets in those estimates or not. So that's a lot better than where we were after Paris, which was on track for three degrees Celsius or higher. Before Paris, it was higher than four degrees Celsius. So we've been making progress and that's important, but it's not good enough. Um, so next year, it's going to be important that they come back, all countries come back to the table with strengthened, strengthened ambition. And I think I think we've got some good signals coming out of Glasgow on how they can do that. And let me just give you a couple of examples. One, there was in Glasgow also this credibility gap, right, where we've seen a number of countries that have announced net zero targets, but still have 2030 targets that do not yet go on a credible path to reach their net zero target. So they're assuming some kind of miracle happens after 2030 and they can decarbonize, but they're not yet on the right track with their 2030 targets. And this includes countries like Australia, China, Brazil, Russia, Saudi Arabia, so they can come back already next year with 2030 targets that align to what they've made commitments on uh, for net zero. Others can actually integrate some of those multiple new initiatives um, that Hero mentioned and others have, have mentioned, those new initiatives on methane, on forest loss, on electric vehicles, or phasing out coal, those are all things that can be integrated into their 2030 targets and strengthen them. And then there are some countries like Indonesia, interestingly, that already have a very good evidence base on how they can step up ambition and do so in a way that will be good for their people and for their economy. So in Indonesia, with great thanks to the Ministry of National Development Planning, BAPANAS, they actually have uh, identified a, a pathway to net zero around mid-century that will actually create and boost jobs, boost uh, income and accelerate poverty reduction, avoid as many as 40,000 deaths from air pollution and make Indonesia's economy much more competitive, robust and resilient. So they've got a good basis for looking at how they can strengthen their ambition in a way which would be good for Indonesians and for the country. 
What COP26 really failed to deliver on, however, was sufficient financing and support for developing countries to help them on this transition, and in particular, to help them to adapt and build resilience and address some of the devastating losses and damages that vulnerable countries are seeing from climate impacts around the world. And that, I think, is the big gap that we're going to need to fill in the lead up to um, COP27 in Egypt. Thank you. Okay. And we'll uh, and we'll explore that uh, as we as we get uh, further into our discussion. But but thanks for that perspective. And so um, uh, we'd like to dive a little bit deeper into the individual perspectives of our panelists uh, who have a, a great well of experience uh, with uh, COP meetings. And if I could start with you, Ambassador Kim. Uh, you've been deeply involved in many uh, climate negotiations through the years, including uh, those for the Paris Agreement. What what changes have you observed uh, in in this process, and how does the latest COP uh, compare with others in your experience? Um, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I would like to say that 1.5 degree ambition, 1.5 degree uh, within reach. That ambition is very clear, which is different from previous COPs. Now, everybody, not only national governments, but also business, civil society, general public, they agree that, okay, 1.5 degree, that's 1.5 degree, that's the goal we have to achieve by the end of this century. So at this Glasgow COP, all countries, they reconfirmed very strong commitment regarding this goal, I think this is the biggest, uh, biggest uh, uh, the success of this uh, Glasgow conference. And if you set 1.5 degrees goal, then you must achieve carbon neutrality by the middle of this century. So there is a broad consensus that anyway, net zero, that's the way we have to go. And you cannot, you cannot, you can, you cannot just give it up. Therefore, whatever your national circumstances are, you must achieve net zero. Therefore, in my view, actually, the Saudis' declaration to achieve net zero by 2060, it's good. Uh, even oil producing companies, gas pro oil producing countries and gas producing countries, they agreed to achieve net zero near the middle of this century. That's a, a very good uh, like outcome of this, mm. this COP meeting. And also everybody agreed to submit their greenhouse gas emission cut plan, NDC. Of course, we are not 100% happy with the, the level of ambition of the NDCs. Still, as Helen mentioned, we have to strengthen our NDCs. Many countries, they must revisit their NDC and look at where they are going to improve. However, mm -hmm. it's very clear for everybody, okay, you must submit your NDC. You yeah. must build your greenhouse gas emission cut plan. And also at this COP, we agreed the transparency, uh, the document. Therefore, everybody must submit their report, how, how good they are on the track of implementation. So this COP meeting is not just, is, is not only about like declaring or committing your, your, your promise, your goal. It's also about what you are going to do for implementation. And everybody is on the same page to submit their reports in the future. Therefore, yeah. Actually, the global community, we have very useful tool to check whether we are on track or not in the future. I think this is the biggest difference from the previous COPs. Okay, well, um, let me uh, pick up on, on the idea of the global community and everybody um, participating. Uh, one, of, one of the dominant themes in the latest COP is equity. And uh, climate change will impact certain countries and groups of people more than others. Um, and I, I want to turn uh, back to Helen to ask you, uh, Helen, how how uh, you assess this issue was was addressed or or failed to be addressed in in Glasgow, and what are the top priority actions that countries, other stakeholders should take 
uh, to achieve just and equitable progress. Um, thanks very much, Jeff. Yet this was a major theme at the discussions and the Glasgow Climate Pact uh, recognizes that developed countries really have a responsibility to help support and provide financing to support developing countries to both build resilience to climate impacts and to accelerate their own transitions to a low carbon clean economy. So that is very much there. However, one of the things that really um, left a long shadow over all the discussions was the fact that rich nations had failed to meet their commitment of mobilizing $100 billion per year in international climate finance by 2020. And similarly, in 2021, they haven't met that. So in, in 2020, they were probably short about $20 billion that year. So they'd failed to meet that. Um, now, um, shockingly, that same year in 2020, while we didn't make it to the 100 billion per year for climate finance internationally, the same year we actually saw um, countries allocate about $345 billion to fossil fuel subsidies and tax breaks. So while on the one hand we couldn't close that 20 billion gap um, for this international climate pledge, we were still doing significant funding for fossil fuel subsidies, which goes in completely the wrong direction. And I don't think um, everyone realized until they arrived in Glasgow just how much this, um, this had actually broken trust between countries by not delivering on this finance uh, commitment. It really was a major breakdown in trust and, and sort of overshadowed a lot of the discussions in Glasgow. That being said, there were some very positive developments on the finance and equity side there. Um, the final text agreed and recognized that rich countries are still very much on the hook to fulfill that 100 billion commitment and must do so as soon as possible and report regularly on progress. Also agreed to at least double funding for adaptation and resilience by 2025, which implies at least $40 billion for adaptation and resilience. So that was an important positive step. And for the first time, they actually agreed a dialogue to discuss funding for loss and damages. Um, this falls far short of what was requested in terms of a mechanism to actually deliver financial support, but it is a start. So it's a procedural start, but something that is a start, again, falling far short of what's needed, but a start. And I have to say on this one, I'm, I'm half Scottish, so I'm, I'm going to brag a little bit. Um, Scotland actually stepped up. Um, on the very first day, and they pledged uh, two million uh, pounds to address losses and damages. So they put forward money on the table and sort of cut across all the diplomatic discussions on whether there should be financing for loss and damage or not, and just said, well, we're putting financing in for loss and damage because we recognize that we have a responsibility to do so. And then we had various philanthropies actually come up behind them um, and uh, make similar commitments. So, so there was definitely um, quite a bit that came forward on the finance and equity issues, but perhaps not as much as we would have hoped. Um, one exciting example that did happen there is um, around South Africa. And this was outside the text, but one of the initiatives, South Africa in advance of COP had actually come forward with a very ambitious 2030 target after a long internal process and really sort of focusing on, on equity and a just transition. And based on that ambition and based on that just transition, we actually got a group of countries, the US, UK, France, Germany, the EU, who came forward and said, okay, we really support what you're doing and we will put $8.5 billion into a partnership to support South Africa's just transition away from coal-fired yeah. electricity. So that was exciting to see that new model develop and come forward there. Well, let's uh, let's pick up on that uh, the theme of following the money, and uh, and uh, we'll come back to UN Special Envoy uh, Hiro Mizuno on on the uh, on the subject of sustainable financing to spur innovation and technology adaptation, and strengthen adaptation to the adversities of climate change. And uh, so, Hiro, I, I we'd uh, like to give you a chance to talk uh, some more about what's been done in terms of mobilizing uh, that kind of sustainable financing and, and what are the key bottlenecks and gaps that remain? Sure, um, I think as Helen described, the, one of the, uh, the biggest failure uh, of the, at the COP by the developed countries is the fail to uh, deliver like a $100 billion climate finance pledge. And then uh, we were informed about the uh, several days before the, the COP, uh, we are missing about 20 billion. So uh, 
we, you know, the uh, the including myself and the uh, the people are involved in that discussion, reach out to the each government trying to, you know, they just, uh, you know, they made some additional uh, the uh, commitment to fill the gap. And one of the success was the, uh, the Prime Minister Kishida of Japan made an additional commitment, 10 billion, uh, including a launch of innovative financial scheme, which I can talk about later uh, if I have time. Uh, but the uh, the the one thing we felt, and that there's a sort of like, a, you know, the uh, um, quite widely spread recognition among the uh, participants at the COP was, uh, you know, the, it's becoming almost impossible for the, uh, the uh, public sector or the government to really provide enough finance. So uh, they just struggled to just to get the, uh, the $100 billion only. Uh, in my from my viewpoint, because I used to be a chief investment officer in the Japanese government pension fund, I used to manage 1.7 trillion dollars. Okay, so uh, I mean, for the private sector <laughs> investors, the 100 billion dollar is not that much much money. But the the getting that commitment from the government it becomes almost impossible. So mm. on one hand, the the government struggled to deliver that finance, but on the other hand, like a Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Uh, more than 450 financial institutions gather to make a commitment uh, to align their businesses or portfolio uh, with 1.5 degree uh, scenario. So uh, that is a one big, uh, you know, the announcement made in Glasgow. And uh, still there's no, you know, the uh, details. And uh, some people may still question like, you know, what that the other uh, commitment means. It's not just uh, like another big like a greenwashing or like just a PR event of like a financial institutions, but I've been you know the I've been in in this industry for the last thirty years and I have been discussing with the older financial leaders and I just felt that this time they really feel that the uh, the you know without uh, you know the uh, committing and uh, aligning their business with the uh, net zero pathway. I, they believe they are they will be out of business or they will end up with a huge stranded asset. So I think this time their commitment is genuine. But the uh, the, the question is whether their commitment, which is for you know 2050, will be backed by the actual action. So uh, in their daily financing or investment activities, that one is the really our homework. So the uh, Secretary General announced in his closing remarks that, that he wanted to set up the uh, high level expert group to really define what net zero means in terms of private businesses commitment. So uh, I think the, uh, the if we manage to really mobilize that amount of money and the Mark Carney always says like, you know, $130 trillion, uh, you know, already agreed uh, to align their, uh, their business with net zero, uh, $130 trillion probably itself uh, has a very, you know, the uh, punchy headline, uh, makes punchy headline. But what really uh, important and it hasn't been really addressed yet was, you know, regardless, you know, regardless of what the analysis, you, whichever analysis you take, everybody talks about like, we need, uh, you know, 150 trillion, $200 trillion to make an energy transition. And the important aspect of that is two thirds of that money have to go into developing countries. But out of that, the $130 trillion aggregated money managed by those financial institutions, less than 10% of the, uh, their portfolio is now invested or financed in finance developing countries. So we need to find a way to how to shift it. And we have a lot of like hard work in front of us because there are a lot of issues uh, yeah. which really slow us down to do that. Yeah. Well, let's 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 go from the uh, the soaring heights of high finance uh, uh, down to the grassroots level, and and I, I wanted to ask Ambassador uh, Kim, uh, you know, one of the biggest stories from Glasgow is uh, what happened outside the conference, and that was a youth uh, gathering to to express their views uh, through through protests and other forms of communication, and it's clear that young people are frustrated by what they perceive to be a lack of tangible action by, by leaders. And they're understandably worried about what their future will look like. So how, how can we do better in addressing the concerns of youth and how can we harness the energy of youth uh, to help to tackle the realities of climate change? Yes, um, I fully understand the frustration that young people have 
because they are the ones who will live with the consequences of climate change and they are facing um, the climate crisis uh, if we are not taking serious actions right now. Uh, therefore, their voices are getting stronger and stronger. And also they are asking government's business to take very revolutionary sometimes actions uh, right now. I mean, if I just to share what, uh, if I just to share my experience in a preparatory cup pre-com meeting in Milan uh, in October, there was a dialogue between young uh, youth representatives and ministers. And youth representatives, 400 young people selected from 18,000 applicants, they were really shouting very outspoken to the ministers to take actions right now. Yes. And in COP26 uh, Glasgow, there was another meeting between ministers and these young people again. And they asked ministers to invite young people, not just as a guest, as a main player in climate change, uh, climate change discussions and decision making. So one sentence I was pretty impressed was, people usually call young people as the leaders of tomorrow, but they don't want to stay as leaders of tomorrow. They believe they are the leaders of today because we are not taking actions right now. We are not taking actions today. There will be no tomorrow. Therefore, they would like to be a significant, a critical part in government decision-making about climate action. They really want their voice not only just to listen, but also reflected, uh, in, included in, in, in the decisions, in the conclusions, in the policies and regulations. Um, therefore, um, actually, uh, if you look at the Glasgow Climate Pact, there is a, 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 a there, we have a language that we are inviting member countries to invite youth representatives in their national delegation and provide them to play a role in climate negotiations as well. Uh, for example, this year, actually, Mexican delegation, they had youth representatives in their delegation. And these young people, they played just like national delegation members. They participated in negotiation as regular, like full power members. So I think more and more countries, they, they need to invite, they, they need to include the young representatives in climate change negotiations and also national decision-making process as well. And also in, at the same line, uh, actually Korean president uh, at the World Leaders Summit, he proposed to, to organize youth climate summit every year. And, mm. and his suggest proposal was reflect, reflected in Glasgow Climate Pact in the form that uh, we invite future uh, COP organizers, future COP presidencies to organize youth climate forum in order to provide uh, the, the, the useful platform for young generation to uh, to, to, to deliver their voices. Yeah. So I think we have to invite young people more and more in our like institutional system. So they are not just to stay outside of the system as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as an outsider, but instead they must come into the, the conference room, negotiation room and decision-making room. Yeah. Well, and I, I think uh, these are excellent points. And we have, I know, thousands of young people who are watching the global town hall and watching us uh, today. And we're looking forward to hearing from them very shortly. Uh, before we do uh, uh, just a few more questions, and I wanted to come back uh, to Special Envoy uh, Mizuno 
to uh, to ask about uh, if you have examples of the kinds of innovative financing mechanisms that we can be looking for in the in the coming years and uh, and how specifically how the, these innovative mechanisms can help the countries uh, who face the most significant barriers to accessing finance uh, in general in capital markets, um, which are also the ones that are often the most affected by climate change. So let's talk about the, uh, the you know, the example we are working on, you know, like uh, some new innovative financial, uh, you know, scheme we are working in this region, Asia. And the one is the, uh, the climate innovative financial facility which the, uh, the uh, Japanese government and Asian Development Bank was working together with the uh, group of philanthropic money, uh, which was Anna also announced at the Glasgow as a global energy alliance to, to create the uh, leveraged uh, you know, facility with the, uh, the guarantee from the government and a grant from, the, uh, from philanthropy to reduce the in interest cost of the uh, developing countries to finance the, uh, their renewable sustainable project, because they are usually for exactly the same renewable energy project, like a developing country, you know, usually pay like a seven, eight times more interest rate. So uh, it should be subsidized. And also the guarantee leverage the other uh, sort of financing cap bandwidth or capability of the, uh, the uh, Asian Development Bank. And also Asian Development Bank was working on the energy transition mechanism, which is they raise the money and the, from the government and the private you know, in the market and to buy the, uh, the coal, power, uh, coal power plant and it phase it out. Uh, so uh, there are several innovations happening uh, in the area of the blended finance. And uh, purely in a private sector, you probably heard that the uh, emergence of the green bond. And uh, now green bond together with the new credit rating mechanism. Today, I heard the news of like, uh, you know, the SMP and the Moody's now integrating uh, ESG uh, factors into their rating. And uh, that will provide the, uh, the different pricing for green or sustainability, you know, the financing uh, tools like uh, the green bond so that the, they can provide the, uh, they can get, you know, the uh, produce, uh, provide the, the capital to the developing countries for adaptation and also the, uh, you know, the building a new facility, uh, this infrastructure with much lower cost. So there are some innovation is happening, whether it's enough, it's not, but we just started seeing, because we have been talking about innovative finance for the last almost 10 years. And this is the first time I really see real, you know, the innovation in the scheme of the other uh, uh, development finance. Well, that's, uh, that's encouraging news uh, if, it, uh, uh, if it continues to develop in that way. And, uh, you know, two of the, the success stories that we understand coming out of uh, COP are the Global Methane Pledge and the Deforestation Pledge. And I, I think this is, a, this is clearly a, a World Resources Institute territory. Uh, so I wanna come back uh, to Ms. Mountford and to ask about, about these pledges because they have, a, they have uh, as I understand, a great potential to decrease global emissions, uh, but they're not legally binding. And the world has made and failed to meet uh, similar pledges like on deforestation in the past. So, so what's needed to ensure that these pledges are met? Uh, you know, what kind of systems and, and what do you see as, the, as the, the obstacles? Thanks very much. Yes, these were two of a number of initiatives that were launched or, or highlighted at Glasgow, which, which really, and I think this is one of the differences from what we've seen before, they're, they're aiming to bring together countries, a number of countries, but also the finance sector, philanthropic finance, private finance, corporate players and others, you know, civil society, academia, et cetera, trying to really deliver some of the transformational change we need to see in key sectors. Um, so these are two of those, but there were a number that were trying to do that, bring together these multi-partner um, initiatives that can really deliver change. So the Global Methane Pledge, um, let me take that one first, uh, that brings together over 100 countries, um, including a number of the major uh, methane emitters, not all, but a number of those, and they've committed to reduce methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Altogether, they account for about half of all methane emissions. Now, reducing methane emissions is one of the largest and fastest climate actions we can actually take 
this decade. It's a super um, uh, potent uh, pollutant. It's about 86 times more powerful than carbon dioxide over 20 years, but it's a short-lived pollutant. So this is a really essential action we can take this decade. But to be honest, methane has largely been overlooked in the past in climate discussions with everyone focusing on carbon dioxide. So, so this was very welcome and very new to have this focus. It is something which we know what the sources are of methane. There's not that many sources. It's oil and gas leakage or flaring. It's uh, waste, um, waste, and it's also from uh, um, from agriculture and ruminant animals. So we've got we've got clear sources. There's multiple benefits from reducing methane, including air pollution benefits that can save you know hundreds of thousands of lives, um, and you know reductions in crop losses, etc. And it's achievable. We've got ample, cheap, off-the-shelf emission control technologies for these. So, so these are ones where we think it's just largely been overlooked before. Coming together now as a group of, of countries and others um, and with finance behind them really shows a positive uh, approach forward to actually deliver on reducing methane emissions. On forests, what we saw was around 140 countries that represent over 85% of the world's forests committing or recommitting in some cases to stopping and reversing forest loss and degradation by 2030. Now, as you mentioned, we've actually had a similar commitment in the past and failed to meet the 2020 targets under that. So what's different now? Why do we think this might have more success? Well, there's two things. One is just this time we've got several new nations that actually joined the agreement, including Brazil and Russia and the Democratic Republic of Congo all incredibly important forested countries that were not there before. Second, we've actually got serious finance coming behind to help support this action. So we've got something like $19.2 billion in public and private funding that's already been committed. And importantly, $1.7 billion of that is actually dedicated to support indigenous peoples and local communities recognize the, recognizing that they play a critical role in this. So now what we need to do is hold them to account, all of these actors to account to actually deliver on this ambition. We need to see the countries include these sorts of initiatives and what they've committed here as they come back next year to update their 2030 targets and use technology and tools to, to monitor their progress. And on the deforestation one, we've actually got something called Global Forest Watch, which WRI and others support which uses satellite data to provide near real-time tracking of deforestation globally at a level that companies can use to monitor their supply chains and governments and others, civil society can use to hold governments to account for these pledges. So we've yeah. got the tools, we've got the solutions. Now we just really need to see they're applied and hold everybody to account. Yeah, so we've, we've um, uh, I think we're hearing clearly a theme about the role of transparency and self-reporting, but self-reporting subject to the scrutiny of others as being uh, a, key, uh, a key development across a range of domains here. Um, we're about to go to the questions that are coming in from our, from our global audience and um, uh, just before we do that, one, one final, uh, a, short, a, a short answer from each of you on uh, how we get, we know that what's on the table at the moment um, is probably not enough to limit global warming to within 1.5 degrees. So uh, I would like to ask uh, each of you to, to suggest uh, one thing that you would like to see as a priority to close that gap, one action uh, or area of action uh, to get us to to within 1.5. And um, and uh, here, if I may, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, there are so many uh, the uh, technicality in the financial, you know, the uh, the businesses or like uh, you know the financial market to solve. But the uh, let me just talk more like a generic the uh, action we can take. You know. Look at the how many company, countries and companies committed net zero at this Glasgow COP26. I, there's a good chance any of the participants of this discussion belong to the organization or country who make that commitment. So you ask your boss or your colleague or your parents, so how are you going to behave differently from tomorrow, mm -hmm. reflecting what your leader committed in a Glasgow? I think that will actually change the, uh, the, the, actual, the organizational behavior and it leads to the actual success of the COP26. 
I think that's a, that's an excellent suggestion. Uh, and Ambassador Kim, uh, what do you think? Um, from national uh, delegations perspective, definitely I must say strengthening NDC by 2030. Yes. And next year, I mean, Glasgow Climate Pact invited all countries as necessary, revisit their NDC and improve their NDC uh, in line with 1.5 degree ambition. Therefore, countries who do not submit the NDC, not yet, or who have rather weak NDC, they must come up with economy-wide absolute term NDC, ambitious NDC by 2030. And this economy-wide absolute term by 2030 NDC then must be a key part of global action to achieve net zero by 2050. Okay, so the, the nationally determined contributions, uh, everybody needs to step up. Yeah. And uh, Helen, uh, you get the last word on this one before we, we throw it open to our global audience. Thanks very much. I'm gonna compliment what um, Hiro and Jenny said and, and just emphasize the absolute utmost importance of delivering the financing um, to support developing countries as they transition uh, towards uh, 1.5C aligned pathways and adapt um, uh, and build resilience to climate impacts. I think that example I cited of South Africa who stepped up their ambition and then a number of countries said, okay, you've done that, we will help support you in delivering that ambition in a way which is a just and equitable transition and provide $8.5 billion of funding to support South Africa in its transition um, is a really good example. And we need to look for more of those around the world so we can really support the ambition and the action that's needed um, in countries everywhere. Okay, well, uh, that's, a, that's a good note on which to pass to our global audience and uh, uh, our team at FPCI has, uh, has been uh, busy uh, gathering uh, messages from around the world. And we will start with uh, Katyusha from Italy, who, who asks the question, how can poor states contribute to the goals established by COP26? So uh, how about the, the poor countries? Uh, 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 maybe the, the UN uh, Special Envoy, uh, Mizuno, you want yeah. to take a shot at that? Sure. I think the, uh, you know, the, what I advise the uh, developing country uh, is just make the other uh, strong commitment and uh, demand the developed country to support that as exactly the other uh, South Africa did. And uh, because this development country has been the uh, sort of like a victim of the, uh, you know, the private businesses and other countries who are trying to sell the obsolete technology to them because it's more profitable. So if you demand, you know, and you commit to the, uh, the higher standard and force the development country to support it, I think that's something like a poor country can do actually to just, uh, you know, the encourage and urge the developed country to take an action. Yeah, I, well, on this one, um, maybe a second perspective, we won't do this for every question, but, um, but uh, Ambassador Kim as a, as a national uh, negotiator, uh, at the at the government to government level, uh, do, do you have anything to add on that? Absolutely. Um, when we are talking about climate action, sometimes we focus too much on mitigation, but at the same level, we must focus on adaptation as well. I mean, adaptation is uh, it, it applies to every country, both the developed and developing countries. Even Korea, we must uh, establish our adaptation strategy because our farmers, our fishermen, because they are struggling due to the climate mm -hmm. change. Therefore, um, developing countries, particularly least developed countries, they must ask support to the developing countries about adaptation. And adaptation is about the survival of human beings. It's about it's it's really about our 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 daily life. Uh, therefore, uh, global community must work together to to help everybody better adapt themselves to the climate change. And particularly, uh, developing countries, least developed countries, they do not have enough resources to 
to, to adopt themselves properly uh, to the, the challenge of the climate change. Therefore, I mean, I think actually developing countries, they can play, uh, they played a very good role in boosting the adaptation agenda to the center of climate discussion. That's mm -hmm. why at COP26 in Glasgow, countries agreed, I mean, the developed countries agreed to redouble their adaptation finance by 2025. And, and, and everybody now agrees that we must give equal weight of attention to the adaptation. Yes. Yeah. So developing countries, they must continue raising their voice about adaptation and also they 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 yeah so adaptation and mitigation though there must be a balance okay uh well this is such a huge uh, question I, i'd like to uh, also give uh, helen mountford a chance to to jump in on this one Thanks so much, Jeff. I very much agree with both what Hiro and, and Jenny said, but I think the other thing that's really important is to recognize the role that some of the most vulnerable countries played in the negotiations and in getting um, some of the successes we actually saw come through on doubling adaptation finance by 2025, on moving forward with finally discussing properly loss and damage, etc. And this really is because they are those who are on the direct front lines of climate impacts. They're seeing it every day. It's already leading to losses of lives, communities, infrastructure in their countries. And if you actually look at some of the speeches, if people didn't actually see them, I would hugely recommend that you watch the speech of the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, on the first day. Mm -hmm. Incredibly heart, heart rending, you know, I mean, really heartbreaking and very, very clear on what is needed. But also, even in the closing plenary, the speeches from some of the small island states and the vulnerable countries, including the um, Marshall Islands, et cetera. It was just so clear how much is at stake here. And I think that constant reminder to the negotiators that this is not about some distant future. You're seeing this in British Columbia right now, I know very starkly, but for them, they're seeing it every single year and they're saying it's about now and it's what's happening to ourselves and our communities. And you cannot afford to wait. We cannot afford to wait. And I think that's what really drove some of the urgency in the decisions to come back again next year and really try again to close the gaps on, on ambition, on finance and on adaptation. Yeah, okay, well said. Uh, so uh, we have a question from Alex in Russia, uh, and this is uh, directed uh, to Hiro Mizuno. Uh, and the, uh, the question, well, the introduction of the question is that uh, countries have agreed to phase out coal power, or I think phase down a coal power, uh, but some of the biggest emitters are missing in action. Uh, will it be possible for developing countries to proceed to net zero by 2050 without appropriate levels of finance and support from developed countries? Well, the answer is no. I mean, the, uh, the, without the, uh, the financial support from the developed countries, uh, it's not going to be possible. But even with the other... Uh, uh, the maximum I think the government, developed countries government can do is not gonna be enough. So that's right, we are trying to mobilize the private uh, the uh, capital uh, to actually invest into developing countries. But once the other, uh, you know, the beauty of the private, uh, the other uh, finances, once they see the opportunities, the money flows. So we need to create the, the one of the things we failed to, failed to discuss today is the importance of the carbon pricing. I mean, uh, the, at the Glasgow, we managed to agree on the, uh, the you know, the Paris, you know, get, get rule book of Paris, but we haven't get, you know, far enough to really discuss on the carbon pricing. But all those, are, you know, the, uh, the landscape from the financial investors, financial, the, uh, the players viewpoint, everything will look different with carbon pricing. So the once mm. carbon prices, it's, you know, the uh, kicks in to the root of the game. I think the other, uh, we can make it, make it happen. Yeah. Well, uh, that actually leads in well to the next question. Um, uh, we have uh, Noah Dari Indonesia uh, from Indonesia uh, asks the panelists, uh, this is on, on the subject of carbon tax or carbon pricing. Uh, do you think it is fair to ask uh, lesser developed, uh, less developed countries to pay the same carbon tax as the developed countries? 
who starts? Uh, maybe I, I, this sounds like a question for Helen. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take a start at this. Um, yeah. So a, a couple of things. One, um, what we've seen in most countries is that the best way to apply a carbon price is to actually start relatively low and then clearly declare how you're going to ramp that up over time, phase it in, mm -hmm. which allows consumers, businesses uh, to adjust. Um, and, and we now have, I believe, around the world, something like 80, 81 countries that are doing carbon pricing now or about to start it. So it spread rapidly um, and is, is gaining traction, including in Indonesia. Uh, I know just before COP26, there was a bill passed on carbon pricing. But similarly, you know, we've seen in Europe for a long time, Canada, very high levels of carbon pricing, Sweden, but also places like Argentina, South Africa, and, and many others. So so we've got a lot of good experience on carbon pricing and how to put this in place in a way that will work and be effective. Um, I do think in most of the discussion so far and the recommendations, people are, are suggesting that there might be different prices for different countries. And again, for any country, ramping it up over time. Um, of course, you need to remember that the carbon price, the revenues of that, actually then go back into the government who can use it for various purposes, right? So what a lot of countries are doing are, are viewing this basically as as a tax to adjust, uh, to, to correct for market failure, they're correcting for air pollution or climate pollution. Um, and then they take that and they use it to redistribute to households and to others. So in Canada, mm -hmm. they've actually got a high carbon price in place. And what they're doing is they're recycling it so that middle income and low income households are as least as well off, if not better off, in many cases better off than they were before the carbon price was in place. In other countries, we've seen um, people using it to actually help support this just transition we were talking about for coal workers, for coal communities, to help them transition to a more diversified economy, to help them move to new job opportunities, et cetera. So one of the things that's really important is also to consider what sort of revenues you need and can use to actually support low-income households, vulnerable populations, or those affected. Um, yeah. So it really is something which, you know, different nations are determining different approaches forward, but starting to realize, I think, some of the benefits of putting carbon pricing in place at their own pace as they do so, but recognizing that as they ramp it up, there's actually some real gains to be had not just in terms of reducing emissions, but actually more broadly for society. Well, and I guess yeah, there's two aspects to that, are there not? There's, there's the price signaling that comes with the, the price on carbon as uh, the, the example in Canada where the money doesn't go into government revenues, it, it is immediately recycled you know, to households as a, as a kind of a tax rebate. Um, uh, and then there's the, the other aspect of, uh, of, of using the funds in a targeted way for, you know, for adaptation or to help those, you know, most affected. Uh, I, do you want to go further on this? Uh, May I say, yeah, I, I think there's a little difference between like a carbon taxation and carbon pricing. So uh, I think the, what I, you know, the code for the carbon pricing, because the, uh, the, one of the issue uh, from the financial professionals uh, viewpoint is at the moment, actually sort of brown infrastructure is more profitable from financiers perspective. And uh, I saw the, uh, some discussion between World Bank president and the private, you know, the uh, uh, private bank CEO. And, uh, you know, their discussion is how to make renewable energy infrastructure more profitable. And the, uh, the most powerful and effective way to do that is that they uh, put the carbon pricing on the coal fire or the other, you know, the less green project. So uh, I think the carbon taxation or carbon pricing a little bit different, but carbon pricing really changed the way the financier behave. Yeah. So we, we have several more questions uh, to get through. So we'll, uh, we're doing very well, but we'll continue to move briskly. And the next question is for, uh, for uh, Ambassador Jenny Kim from Sam in Lithuania, uh, who says this year's Climate Adaptation Fund is still unreached. Uh, this gives a sense of how climate is not every country's main priority. How will the developed countries ensure that they can bring adequate finance to developing and least developing countries in the long term? Um, thank you for that question. Yes, as I mentioned uh, earlier, 
adaptation and adaptation finance really uh, became a key agenda at uh, COP discussion uh, in Glasgow. So uh, if you look at the climate, uh, Glasgow Climate Pact, actually it starts with the science and then adaptation and adaptation finance come. Therefore, it means now the UNFCCC parties, they are, they are putting more priority, more weight to the adaptation and adaptation finance issues. So, uh, and uh, countries agreed to, to, to increase the adaptation finance and more strong commitments, more and more commitments uh, from developed countries are coming uh, to, to provide resources in adaptation. Therefore, I'm, I'm positive that uh, more constructive discussions will continue in adaptation, particularly for developing and least developed countries. Uh, there are many, uh, I mean, the least, particularly the least developed countries uh, and small island countries, they are the most vulnerable ones negatively hit by uh, the impact of climate change. And uh, it's important for UNFCCC members to keep this momentum uh, with uh, the prioritization of adaptation and adaptation finance. So next year in Egypt and, and, and in, in, in 2023, when uh, the, the global community will, will have the global stock take uh, about climate action, adaptation and adaptation finance must be uh, at the center of discussions. Okay. So I have a question. We have received a question from Arpan in Japan. Uh, uh, once again for Hiro Mizuno. Uh, and the question is, do you think poor and developing countries are too dependent on uh, GCF assistance to deal with the climate crisis? And how do we make sure that GCF assistance actually helps in addressing environmental issues? Mm, um, <laughs> you know, I think the, uh, well, well, <laughs> We develop the system like you know they have to depend on that kind of thing. So uh, um, we need to give them a you know the fair uh, support, and then uh, but at the same time we need to support the uh, or aid the uh, the developing country to become independent to pursue the our uh, common goals. So uh, I think the one thing is just uh, trying to just uh, use that kind of a GFC and to just uh, address the immediate uh, the uh, issues. But at the same time we just need to educate the uh, you know the businesses and the government in developing countries to to kind of like a you know uh make, make self 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 the uh the start uh their transition to the uh, net zero goals so uh, mm -hmm. uh so for the time being i mean given the uh, the damage the uh, developed countries created in the past i think we need to take a fair share uh of those are uh, the other uh, burdens but the uh you know that we need to educate them at the same time unless otherwise we just let them depend upon uh, the uh, the us all the time. So uh, it's just a matter of the education and support. Uh, you know, the uh, at this point of time, it's very critical. Okay. Well, we we have um, uh, a comment a contribution from Irene Chatarina in Indonesia, um, who writes: uh, Being a youth, a Gen Z, um, while studying international relations in university, I sometimes wonder. What are the actual measures of the success of the success of COP26 in dealing with climate change issues? Because this is an issue that must be addressed immediately and can no longer be held by those in power. Um, I, I wonder if you if the, the panelists have a have a reaction to that statement. Maybe Ambassador Kim. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether I understood correctly, but can you just repeat the comments again? So what, what are the actual uh, measures of success of the COP26 in dealing with climate change issues? Um, measures of success, uh, um, I think... <laughs> Okay, um, I, I, I would like to say now climate change is really at the center of national agenda, business strategy, and people's attention. 
in the mm -hmm. past, I mean, in five years ago, 10 years ago, there were like a confrontational uh, like discussions, whether climate change is real, is it science-based, is it really climate crisis and many others. However, now I believe everybody is on the same page. And mm -hmm. net zero by the middle of this century, 1.5 uh, degree ambition, nobody says, no, I do not want that. Nobody, nobody says like that. Now that's um, not a matter of option. That's a matter of how fast we are going to achieve. I mean, yeah. how well we are going to implement uh, our commitment. Therefore, uh, in that sense, if I say uh, the measures of success of COP26 is we recommitted our, our, our goal of 1.5 degree ambition. Yeah. Uh, Alan, do you have something to add on that? Thanks. I mean, just briefly, this is this is probably in some ways one of the harder cops to read in terms of success or failure. And you'll have seen very divergent views out there. I think mm -hmm. I think the way we've sort of put it is there's actually two truths out there and both of them are true. One, on the one hand, it actually delivered much more on ambition and on finance than many of us expected. And then what we've seen before in many cases. Right. So it delivered a lot on progress. Two, the second truth is it delivered nowhere near enough, right? We're far off track and sort of, and that was clearly recognized. So to me, the, the real question of how successful yeah. COP26 was, we'll know actually next year, because yeah. what it did was said, okay, we've moved the needle on the 1.5C goal. We've moved closer to, to, to keeping that alive. We've moved the needle on finance, but not enough. And we're agreeing that next year, unusually, we're actually going to try and ramp up even further. Normally, it would have been another four or five years before they ramp up. Now they're saying they're coming back next year. So the real question is, do they successfully come back next year? Do countries come back to the table with enough ambition that they can close those gaps? So yeah. then we'll know whether and how successful this one has actually been by setting up those processes to do that. Well, then um, we'll, we'll come around a circle here for a final question to wrap up uh, with uh, a short answer from each of you, uh, and we'll, we'll start with Helen on this one. Uh, Michael in India uh, writes, what can the person in the street like me do to help delay or stop climate change? Helen? <laughs> Vote. I actually think the most important thing, there's a lot you can do in your personal choices, but the absolute most important thing is to vote for politicians who are taking this seriously and will actually take action. Similarly, the companies you go to, the banks that you bank with, make sure they are doing the right thing. And if they're not, be vocal about it. So that, that is going to be what we need to change the systems to really hold governments, companies, others to account is by voting and being vocal about what is needed on climate action. Okay, uh, Hero, what uh, what advice do you have for the person in the street? Well, I fully agree what the uh, just Helen said, but the, the uh, voting for the politician who really leads the on leads their climate action. But also, uh, don't forget you are the consumer, and uh, you know the company or private sector. You know the business is most concerned about the how they are perceived by consumer. So uh, you know the, the you make your you know the uh, conscious choices. What do you buy? What do you use? But once again, I made the another. I mean, uh, the advice is earlier that the uh, talk to your parents or talk to the uh, the you know the uh, the if you already work for the company, ask your boss. You know what yeah. you're gonna do differently, <laughs> reflecting the, uh, the the their their commitment. Yeah, and uh, uh, Jenny, we'll give the last word on this. Yeah, to you. I mean, on top of what Helen and Hero just mentioned, I mean, those are wonderful uh, suggestions. Uh, on top of that, I would like to say, okay, just to change your behavior as well, because you, uh, I mean, if you really want to be a part of climate action, you need to change your way of life. Uh, so you need to save your energy. You have to uh, think about when you consume uh, products. You have to think about what your attitude, what your behavior uh, are actually 
whether it is in favor of the climate or or in in, in not uh, it's, it's it's negative for environment. So think about your behavior, your attitude, and then change it. Okay. Uh, well, it's a that's a great it's a great message to deliver to our global audience. And uh, uh, with that, uh, uh, it uh, comes to me uh, to to conclude the session. Uh, let me say, I think it would be very difficult to sum up uh, everything that we've covered here. I'm so grateful to our panelists uh, for covering so much territory and answering the questions so well. Uh, I'd also like to give a big thanks uh, to uh, Xing Kwok Choi for uh, very stimulating and thought-provoking introductory uh, remarks that brought us the four C's and the three T's. And I think we've been through them in the course of the discussion. Um, so uh, uh, let me also say to our uh, to the team at FPCI, thank you so much for your excellent work in bringing this panel together and for the tremendous achievement of the Global Town Hall, which is really a signature event uh, for foreign policy communities uh, all over the world. And as uh, the president of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, I'm delighted that we've been able to, to partner with FCI, FPCI in the Global Town Hall. Uh, the messages that I, that I took away, uh, we kind of hit, I think the bullseye in the middle of the session when I asked for top suggestions from each of you, and we came up with, uh, you know, deliver the financing, uh, improve the national uh, contribution uh, commitments, and uh, hold your bosses, hold your leaders, uh, hold uh, decision makers to account. And uh, I think this is, uh, it's been a tremendously productive session. Thanks again uh, to Hiro Mizuno, to Helen Mountford, to Jenny Kim, and to Xing Kwok Choi. And thank you to our audience uh, around the world for your, for your questions. And we look forward to continuing the dialogue for now. Uh, that's all from us in Tokyo and Seoul and Washington and Singapore. And a good day to everybody from me in Vancouver. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.